current best guess uh, or best um, estimate is that it will carry on expanding forever. And the reason I say that is because that the universe is accelerating in its expansion, which is a great mystery because before that discovery, we thought, well, gravity is always attractive. And so it should be, you know, we've got all these galaxies in the universe and the universe has been expanding since the Big Bang. And so it should at least be slowing down. And there was even a question as, uh, is there enough matter in it to slow it down so much that it stops and recollapses again? But this new discovery, it's only a, a decade old or so, that the universe is accelerating in its expansion, suggests that it will continue to accelerate unless some new physics appears that we don't understand and so it will just continue to expand forever. The standard answer, as best we know at the moment, is that it doesn't expand into anything because it's space itself, and actually space, time, if you talk to Einstein, that's expanding. So it's not the right picture to think of a Big Bang in a pre-existing space, like, a, like imagine this room is the space and the Big Bang happens in the middle of the room. It's not like that at all. It seems that as far as we know, space and time began at the Big Bang and they've been stretching ever since. And so a, a kind of a related idea, it's very difficult to picture these ideas, but they're fun, right? Is, is where did the Big Bang happen? Right? You, you, can imagine, you think, well, we're in this big box of a universe. Did it happen over there or over there or over there? It, it happened everywhere because all the space um, that's here now in this room was there, was, was made as far as we know at the Big Bang. So the Big Bang happened everywhere. So it's not expanding into anything. It's very difficult to picture that. What I should say is that the theory that, that deals with this, the, the, the underpinning, it's called Einstein's theory of general relativity. He wrote it down in 1915 and it's still our best theory of space and time and the theory upon which all these interesting and strange ideas rest. And you learn that. It's quite tricky because it's all about curved space, but you learn it in a physics degree. So if you, if you, if you do a physics degree, you, you start learning about these ideas. It's just you learn about them because the maths is a bit hard, <laughs> to be frank, because it's all about curvy space. What's that Doctor Who, isn't it? Curvy, wiggly, wobbly, spacey, timey. That's what it, <laughs> that's it basically. <laughs> So, it's a great question. I think everybody does. I think every, every scientist, that no scientist can picture that number. I mean, he, even the small number, 200 billion, <laughs> which is the, the number of stars number, right. in one galaxy. And then when you say two trillion galaxies, you know, that, that's, I challenge anyone to be able to picture that. But it is the reality that we've observed. We've, you know, we, I mean, we haven't counted all two trillion, by the way. We have, we have a thing called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which maps the positions of galaxies. So you can, you, you know how much of the sky you've surveyed and you know how many galaxies you've counted. And then you can spread that across the wider universe. And you get this picture of a vast and possibly infinite universe. I mean, we, we know that the universe, or, or very strongly suspect, that the universe is much bigger than the piece we can see. So we have good reason to think that's the case. Whether it's infinite or not is another question. And then that goes to your, you know, the, can you picture infinity? Well, no one can picture infinity. There's, no. a, there's, there's a weird thing as well about, you know, we, we say the universe began 13.8 billion years ago. So that's a measurement because we can measure the speed that all the galaxies are flying away from us, essentially. And then you, so you can run time backwards, if you like, to, to find out when they were all on top of each other. And so it's a quite a simple measurement, and we've done that. So we say the universe began 13.8 billion years ago. But actually, all we know really was the universe was very hot and very dense at that time. And we have some theories that the universe was in existence before that, and perhaps some sort of circumstantial evidence. And that means that actually the universe could, could have always been there eternal and um, then when, when I talk to people sometimes they get a bit some people get upset about that some people would rather it had a beginning <laughs> and yeah. the, the idea that it might have been around forever is more frightening somehow than the fact that it began and uh, it's it's interesting the way that people's minds work what what terrifies you the most an eternal universe or a finite universe those theories are back in vogue. Some of those theories are back in vogue again. So yes, some of them say that there's a, a cycling universe. Um, so the Big Bang is an event when space gets very hot and very dense and filled with particles. And that may happen again. Or some of the other theories 
Uh, there's a theory called eternal inflation, which is a theory that, and it's actually the most popular theory, I think, at the moment, for what happened, for why the Big Bang is the way that it is. Because it's got some very special features, the Big Bang, which we could talk about. But inflation is the idea that space, space-time was around before the Big Bang, and it was expanding extremely fast. And it was doubling in size in the most popular of these theories every 10 to the minus 37 seconds, which is point naught, 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 with 37 noughts, one of a second. So it's an unimaginably fast expansion. And then the idea is that draws to a close, so it quite naturally sort of dies away and the expansion slows down. And all the energy that was taken, that was causing that expansion, sort of gets dumped into space and heats it up and makes particles, and that's what we call the Big Bang. And those theories, the slight extension to those, um, say that, that that slowing down just happens in little patches. So most of the universe, the overwhelming majority of the universe, is still inflating at that insane sort of speed. And the just little patches stop and they're big bangs. So you get multiple universes, a multiverse. It's called the inflationary multiverse. And we are in one of those bubbles. And that's one of the more popular theories. Well, is there anything beyond the universe? Um, probably not. Uh, we suspect quite strongly that, that our universe is, it could well be infinite in extent, even, even our bit of the universe, even notwithstanding what I just said about this eternal inflation stuff. If you just take our universe, it's certainly, we're sure it exists far beyond the bit we can see. So why would I say that? Well, if you think about it, the universe, is, the, our bit at least, has been around 13.8 billion years. That means that light has only had 13.8 billion years to travel from the, from the bit that we can see to our eye. So we can only see as far as light has had time to travel. But we think there's a lot beyond that because of measurements we've made of how the universe is, is curved and what the structure of the universe is. So it undoubtedly extends beyond the little bubble that we can see. Um, how far it extends, it's another great question. Uh, we don't know, but it could be infinite in extent. In the universe, what is our position? What is our place in space? Well, we now know, of course, that we are part of a galaxy, the Milky Way. Um, in the Southern Hemisphere, they're fortunate because they're pointing towards the galactic center. So the rich star fields of Sagittarius are visible. The top of this arc is the center of our galaxy, uh, obscuring a supermassive black hole, four million times the mass of the sun. We're looking at a galaxy, 200 billion stars or so. We now know that most of those, if not the, the overwhelming majority, have solar systems. The current number for the, the, the estimate, the number of Earth-like planets in that galaxy, that's rocky planets, the right distance from their star to potentially support oceans on the surface, is of order 20 billion. So we're speaking about, in terms of one in 10 stars in the Milky Way, having a potentially Earth-like planet around it. Now, we can't, of course, see the structure of a, a typical galaxy from within. We have to step outside. And when we step outside and start to look at local galaxies, the, the scale of the challenge of trying to understand the universe, I think, becomes clear. And this is a photograph of a nearby galaxy, one of our local neighbors, about 23 million light years away. It's called the Whirlpool Galaxy. You can see this actually with a relatively small telescope, a four or five inch telescope. Um, but the scale of the photograph is challenging. It's about 100,000 light years across, which means light traveling 186,000 miles a second takes of order 100,000 years to cross this photograph. It's also uh, interesting because it's a photograph of an interacting galaxy. So the little yellow blob there on the right is a smaller dwarf galaxy, which is distorting the spiral arm, causing increased rates of star formation in that arm. So although the galaxies are relatively sparsely distributed across the universe, they're not so sparsely distributed that they don't interact with each other. Step out again, and we face the large scale structure of the universe. And um, this is a, a visualization of real data. It's a visualization of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. 
which is a project to map the positions of relatively local galaxies in the universe. So although in this animation the, the points are exaggerated so you can see them, the distribution of the points is correct. So this is a fly-through of the local universe. And you see, at first sight, it just looks like a snowstorm, a random distribution of galaxies. Um, but in fact, it isn't entirely random, or it's random in a very particular way. I think Martin Rees will talk a little bit about this later on. But when you look more closely, you see that there are sort of rivers and flows of galaxies. There are voids where there are fewer galaxies and areas where the distribution of galaxies is more dense. And that is indeed telling us something about the, the formation of the galaxies, the processes that seeded the distribution of galaxies in the sky. And that's telling us something about events that happened very much closer to the origin of the universe when there were no galaxies. And again, I think Martin Rees will talk about that distribution a little bit later on. But I think the, the overwhelming sense that I certainly get from looking at visualizations like this is that the universe is big. Um, the current estimate for the number of galaxies, large and small, in the observable part of the universe is around two trillion. And it seems to increase every few years when more data comes in. But if you think about even the observable piece of the universe containing two trillion galaxies, I think the, the ambition of cosmology becomes clear, the ambition to understand where all that came from and how those structures emerged in the universe is a tremendous one. The, that's how the stuff that I said at the start, how we know it. Uh, we know that the universe was very hot and very dense 13.73 billion years ago because we've analysed the light from the distant galaxies. We know it's been expanding and cooling ever since. What could we possibly say, though, about the processes that built the stars and the planets and the galaxies? I've said nothing about that. We've just measured how fast it expands. Well, there's something else which is very interesting and actually goes back to some research that was done about just 100 metres away from this room, actually, across the road uh, at the turn of the last century, almost exactly 100 years ago, a man called Ernest Rutherford, who, in a little laboratory which is still there over the road, if you have time, you can go and, you can go and look at it after the lecture, he discovered the atomic nucleus. He was the first person to see that atoms are built of a nucleus, a small, dense nucleus with electrons going around the outside, just by doing experiments on a bench top. That was the beginning of a journey that we've gone on ever since. It's now called particle physics. And what we found is that as you go back in time, so you start here 13.73 billion years after the Big Bang and sweep back in time towards the Big Bang, what happens? Well, the universe shrinks, the universe gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and in the footsteps of Rutherford, we found it gets simpler and simpler and simpler. So remarkably, and we don't really know a deep reason for this other than that we've seen it experimentally, remarkably, when you go back to the first second or the first thousandth of a second or the first millionth of a second after the Big Bang, you find that the universe was extremely simple indeed. So our picture is that the universe has been expanding and cooling ever since it began and getting more complicated. So things like you and me and stars and planets and galaxies, these complicated structures that we see out there in the universe are in a sense properties of an old and cold universe, right? In a sense they've crystallised out. But if you sweep back in time, the universe, well that structure melts away as the universe gets hotter and you find a very simple universe indeed, a universe that we can understand to a large extent. So the problem, the, the scientific problem in the spirit of Richard Feynman is to do the following. We want to guess about how this structure emerged and then we want to do experiments. But we want to do experiments back here. What we really want to do is build a time machine and sweep back to the first billionth of a second after the Big Bang or before and observe what's happening in the universe. We can't do that, unfortunately. But what we can do is recreate those conditions in a lab. The conditions of very hot, very dense, very energetic space. the size and the scale of the universe and our place within it, which you're forced to do when you think about the, the distance scales and the sheer size and age of the universe, then um, I think it's very natural for us to tend to come to the conclusion that we don't matter at all. Uh, and it's true in some sense, just physically, um, what are we? We're little specks of, of, of just a collection of atoms on one 
moat of dust orbiting around one little star in, in 400 billion stars in one galaxy amongst two trillion galaxies in a small patch of a potentially infinite universe. So it, clearly it, it is true. We are physically insignificant. So I've tended in, in the past to focus um, arguments or think about arguments of our value um, in, in the context of uh, what does it mean to live these finite, fragile lives in this infinite universe? And I can make a strong argument and, and, and have many times that notwithstanding our physical insignificance, we may be remarkably valuable because the, the number of civilizations on the average in a particular galaxy, any given galaxy, might be less than one on the average. Many galaxies may not even have civilizations in them. If that is the case, and that it, it's speculative, but if it's the case, then we would be remarkably valuable, notwithstanding our physical insignificance, because we would be uh, perhaps the only place in the Milky Way galaxy where collections of atoms have come together that can think and do science and have conversations like this in a very real sense bring meaning to an otherwise meaningless galaxy. So that, that, that has been my position for some time. I think, it's a, I think it's a good working hypothesis, by the way, as an aside. If you, you think that uh, we, I think Carl Sagan said it many years ago, in, in some sense, if that's the case, we have a responsibility to the cosmos itself. Uh, because, you know, we're, we're, we're a product of 13.8 billion years of cosmic evolution, but we might be a very rare and special product. But we might only be here, we, we'll only be here for a small amount of time. The, the, the sun will only be here for a small amount of time in cosmic timescales and so on. So I, I've tended to make that argument. But one of the great joys about um, reading other people's views about essentially being a scientist, is that you can come across a point of view and you think, I hadn't thought of that, that I, that I might change my mind given that, that, that wonderful piece of thought. And I found it happened to me recently. I was reading a book, it's a very old book now, by David Deutsch, who is one of the, the greats, one of the founders of quantum computing. So it, is a, it really is a a physicist and a thinker worth paying attention to. And he made a point, which I had heard before actually, in a book called The Anthropic Cosmological Principle by John Bauer and Frank Tipler, which was a huge influence on me when I was an undergraduate physicist, so I couldn't believe I'd forgotten this point. But David Deutsch and Bauer and Tipler pointed out that it's not necessarily the case that life will always be a speck Right, something that's very valuable and local in the universe. Oh, so that's a good question. And th this is a, a really simple observation. You, could, you can almost do it yourself, actually. Um, you, you can with a bit of quite advanced amateur astronomy kit, but not a big professional telescope, you can do this. So what you do is you look at the light from distant galaxies. Um, so you have a, a big enough telescope that you can see a galaxy that's quite a long way away and you look at the light from it. But what you find is that for all galaxies that are not too close, then the light is stretched. So if you think of light as a, as a wave, a bit like a wave on water with peaks and crests, then the distance between two peaks gives you the colour. And so red light has got a big distance between the peaks and blue light has got a smaller distance. And what you find is that from all galaxies that are further away than the closest ones, the, the, the light is stretched so that the colours of the light from the galaxy are a bit redder. And what you find is the more distant the galaxy, the more the stretch. So that's the observation. And that's exactly what you'd expect if the galaxies were riding along on a stretching fabric, the fabric of the universe, if you like. That means that the further away the galaxies are, then the, the, the more stretched the light will be. Why? Because it's been journeying through the stretching space for longer, so it's got more stretched. And that's a, it's called the Hubble Law, actually. It was first observed in the 1920s by Edwin Hubble. So it's a very simple